River tables are pretty cool, right? Glass, epoxy, whatever. But at a certain point, I gotta admit, I'm kind of sick of seeing them. So what if we did something new? Like, built one using Lego. Alright, so the first order of business was making my river pattern out of the Lego. And I started this where I pretty much start every project, on the computer. Coming up with a few different ideas until I landed on one that I liked. So after I had my pattern down, I separated them out by color to figure out how many of each Lego that I'd need. And then I headed down to the Lego store to get them. And this is where I ran into my first problem. So I based most of my design off of bricks that are 4x2, but at the store, they didn't carry every color in 4x2. So for example, all of my blue bricks are 2x1 bricks. Luckily, you can put four of them together and mimic the shape of a 4x2, but it just made putting the whole thing together a little bit more tricky. Oh, and I'm sure I'm going to get this question a lot, so $45. I'll let you figure out what that's the answer to. Anyhow, what you see me doing here is building up my pattern upside down and using these black flat pieces to lock everything together. With that out of the way, I started building the form for casting my concrete, which is going to be made out of melamine. So I started off by breaking down a big sheet using my track saw, and then once it was a little bit more manageable of a size, I took it over to the table saw to cut it to the finish size. And this went perfectly. Absolutely zero problems. Like, not even one mistake. Okay, so actually the form is pretty simple. It's just five pieces that make up a box like this. But the one tricky thing that we're going to need to do is create a recess in the bottom of the form for the nubs of the top of the Lego to sit in. This way the top of the Lego, not counting the nubs, are flush with the bottom of the form and will in turn wind up flush with the top of the concrete. Does that make sense? Basically, otherwise the concrete would flow right over the Lego, or under it, when you're pouring. So here I've added a lot of extra Lego and some hot glue to keep everything really rigid while we trace out the shape of what we're going to need to carve into the form. It's really important that nothing moves at this stage of the game, but all those Lego are going to get removed before we pour the concrete. Next I set the cut depth of my router so that it matched the height of a Lego nub. And then I went about carving the recess for my pattern. And this was probably the single most tedious part of the entire build. And if you're wondering why I'm dressed like a cholo on Easter in this shot, it's because MDF makes me itch. And I guess I'd just rather be hot than itchy. Later that night we could start putting the form together. So we screwed in one side, laid the Lego slab in, and then used silicone in all of the corners where the Lego's going to meet the concrete. And I know right here it just looks like a huge mess in this shot, but just know that it's the same principle as what you're going to see in some later shots where the corners of the form meet. It just looks more confusing here. Anyhow, the next day the silicone was dry and we removed it all from the form so that we could start casting the concrete. And here you can see the purpose of the silicone and how it's going to give the concrete a really clean round overlook. Okay, so onto the concrete. Here we're mixing up our dry with some black pigment because we're going to go for a darker look. And then we're going to do an initial face coat that'll get sprayed on. Now I'd never done this and it seemed like a really bad time to test, so we just had Mike take the lead. And by the way, that's who you've been seeing me collaborating with here. Mike Clifford from Industrial Maker. And we actually built another project for his channel during this collaboration. A really awesome curved bench, so definitely go check that out after this one. And I'll put a link at the end and in the description for you. Anyhow, after we had the face coat on, we mixed up another batch that had our alkaline resistant glass fibers in them and used it to backfill everything. By the next day, the concrete was set up enough that we could start grinding it. So here I'm using the form as a guide to flatten what will be the bottom of the slab. And by the time I was finished, I had a serious case of concrete crutch. I'll let you make your own joke. And finally that night, it was time that we could demold this guy. And I think this was my favorite part about concrete work. It's like Christmas morning for bad kids, where you're not sure if Santa's going to bring you what you asked for or a lump of coal. Honestly, I was probably like 50-50 as to whether I was going to be happy with the outcome. Not bad. Anyhow, the next day, the final thing that we had to do to the top before I could start working on the base was a little wet sanding and then seal it. 
And since a buddy who owns a drone came to visit, we had to get at least one shot with that. So having the top out of the way and starting in on the base, which is made out of wood, was a huge sigh of relief. It felt like the work was done and now it was just time to bring it home. But actually going in, I wasn't really sure what I was gonna do design-wise. So I came up with a couple ideas and ultimately landed on this one, which is probably the most simple. Basically, I wanted something that complemented the top but didn't compete with it. The base's job was to sort of be invisible. And that doesn't mean clear or as thin as possible or anything like that, but rather as undistracting as possible. With a solid plan in mind, I started off over at the joiner to flatten my workpiece, and then moved over to the planer to bring it down to a finished thickness of just over an inch and a half thick. Then over at the table saw, I took my board and cut out some strips that are also just over an inch and a half wide. And the reason I like to do this, especially when I'm working with harder woods, this is maple by the way, is that you can get a much cleaner result having your last pass be where you're just removing a tiny bit of material. So here now in this shot, the fence is set right to the finish thickness, which is going to be an inch and a half. I suppose the downside to doing it this way is it takes a little bit longer and ends up producing way more sawdust. But the good thing is that sawdust looks good in slow motion. Next I got out my crosscut sled and put a clean edge on one end of each piece, then measured out the length of the finished pieces I need and used the crosscut sled again to finalize everything. Question, have river tables jumped the shark yet? I'll be honest, I kinda hope so. And if not, maybe this video can serve as a ramp to provide a little more lift. All right, I'm half joking. But in all honesty, here's what I really think. The initial idea was brilliant. I mean, that's evidenced by how many people have made versions of their own. It can't be denied. And plenty of people have had new takes on them that have been really great too. But the thing about them that bugs me and I fully realize that this has more to do with me and my psyche than the people making river tables. But anyway, the thing that bugs me is that I see it as a crutch for creativity. I see it as kind of doubting your own ability to be creative and thus letting the material be creative for you. And again, I know that isn't the truth. It's more of a window into my head, I guess. And here's why I think. It's because I get scared. I have moments where I'm afraid that I'm never going to have another good idea, or something that excites me. And I guess this is just me projecting that fear onto other people. But here's the thing. Every time I get that feeling, I'll get depressed for a couple days, but it's almost always followed up by a surge of new ideas. I don't know why, it's just kind of always been the way things have gone for me. But for whatever reason, I think it just makes me overly sensitive to people doubting their ability to be creative. I just hate seeing that and I hate hearing people say that about themselves. I truly do think that anybody can be creative if they're able to just get out of their own way. So I don't know, maybe I'm not alone and maybe somebody out there feels the same. So if that's you, I just wanna let you know that you can be creative and all you have to do is take those doubts, take those fears and just let go. Do me a favor, if you're still watching this, I gotta assume that you enjoyed it, so hit that subscribe button and notification bell. It would mean the world to me. And special thanks to Mark Yates, Patricio Rodriguez, Wayne, Jesse Anderson, Jeff Treleven, Robert Westoff, Aaron Bauman, Daniel Pressburg, and the rest of my Patreon supporters for making these videos possible. And if you want to find out how you can support the show too, click the Patreon link in the description to see if it's right for you. And as always, no pressure. Thanks for watching and 
I'll see you next time.